Loving God, continue to speak to us through our text this morning, and may the words of my mouth and meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. You are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Today we are officially uh, kicking off our spring stewardship campaign uh, to uh, raise the funds to support the operating budget of this church. Uh, the theme this year is Share the Gift, to Grow in Faith. And uh, I'm grateful once again to Jay and Meredith Holloman for chairing the stewardship campaign again this year. And you're going to hear from them uh, a little bit later in uh, the service. Um, I'm recommending uh, an interesting book as a resource. Last year we looked at Adam Hamilton's book, Enough. And this year I'm recommending Christian Smith's book, Passing uh, the Plate. Uh, we should be getting some copies into our bookstore. And uh, the book has a lot of fascinating research about religious uh, giving in our country. Uh, but every time we begin a stewardship campaign, um, a couple things happen. Uh, I start to see some of you squirming in your seats, and I got a good view from up here. The other thing is I think of the story of the preacher who stood up before his church and he said, I've got good news and I've got bad news. Which do you want to hear first? I said, well, tell us the good news. He said, the good news is we've got plenty of money to underwrite the operating budget for this congregation for the upcoming year. They said, well, that's great. What's the bad news? Because the bad news is it's still in your bank accounts. <laughs> so between now and Commitment Sunday, I want everybody to think about that. And um, we're going to be uh, uh, talking about stewardship for a couple of weeks this spring. Let me say just a couple of things this morning to begin uh, regarding stewardship at Woodmont. The first is thank you. Thank you to those of you who support the ministries and mission of this church, and some of you have done it for years and for decades uh, in many cases. So thank you for your generosity and for your sacrifice year after year. The second thing that I want to say is that in a day and age where there are a, a growing number of nonprofits in our world, and we all know that, um, you've heard me say before that church people have to support the church and the ministries of the church. So when Megan and I write our check every month to Woodmont, we feel good about it, we trust the leadership, <laughs> and we know that it's being used wisely and responsibly to make a difference in the lives of many people. Uh, we believe that through our ministries, we are changing lives each and every day. We're changing lives when a Habitat house is built and a family moves in, when a hungry person is fed by the food project, when a homeless person has a warm bed and two meals at Room in the Inn, when an alcoholic gives up drinking and comes to AA on a Tuesday or, or Thursday night up at South Hall, when a person uh, whose world has fallen apart because they've gone through a divorce uh, comes to divorce care on Wednesday and gets their life back together, when a child comes to Sunday school to learn about the love of God and the teachings of Jesus, when a, a marriage is, is saved through counseling, when a fifth grader gets baptized, when outreach grants are made, when Bible studies are taught, when small groups are, are, are started, when a Stephen minister helps somebody find hope who didn't have hope beforehand, uh, when a person who's been hurt by the church comes back and gets involved in the, in the bridge, when a family puts their children in our preschool for those formative years, when a youth learns about self-esteem and about God's love, when a mission team goes to Guatemala or Swaziland or Haiti or, or uh, Morgan Scott, um, these are the ways that lives are impacted every day, every week at Woodmont. And your generosity makes that uh, possible. So I hope over the next few weeks you will consider uh, being a part of this campaign and fill out a commitment card to support the budget for the upcoming year. We do this so that we can plan responsibly, but we also do this so that we can make a commitment to Christ and to the ministries of this church. For two months now, we have been journeying uh, through the Sermon on the Mount, uh, that famous passage of Scripture found in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. Uh, we started with the Beatitudes back in early February where we talked about the, the, the keys to the blessed life, the happy life, the fulfilled life. We talked about anger and lust and retaliation, turning the other cheek, loving enemies, humility. We've talked about prayer, money, materialism, compassion, worry, judgment, the golden rule. And today, we're bringing this series to a close 
because Palm Sunday is next week and Easter is only two weeks away. How do we know if our faith is real and alive? How do we know if we are living the Christian life and not just proclaiming it? How do we know if we are doing what Jesus commands us to do in this world? Jesus says, you will know them by their fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. You will know them by their fruit. James says, what good is it if you say that you have faith but do not have works? Can faith save you? If a brother or sister is naked and lacks daily food and one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and eat your fill, and yet you do not supply their bodily needs, what is the good of that? Faith by itself, if it has no works, is dead, James says. Edgar Guest wrote a poem a number of years ago that I love, titled, I'd Rather See a Sermon. He says, I'd rather see a sermon than hear one any day. I'd rather one should walk with me than merely tell the way. The eyes of better pupil and more willing than the ear. Find counsel is confusing, but examples always clear. And the best of all the preachers are the ones who live their creeds. For to see good put into action is what everybody needs. I can soon learn to do it if you'll let me see it done. I can watch your hands in action, but your tongue too fast may run. And the lecture you deliver may be very wise and very true, but I'd rather get my lessons by observing what you do. For I might misunderstand you and the high advice you give, but there's no misunderstanding how you act and how you live. When I was in college at TCU, I had a lot of fun. Uh, perhaps a little bit too much fun. Uh, it was an interesting journey from the SAE house to Princeton Seminary uh, a year later. But when I was deciding whether or not to go into the ministry, to go to seminary and subsequently go into the ministry, one of the factors that I had to wrestle with was the glass house that ministers live in. You see, I had grown up in the glass house in Memphis. My father uh, was a preacher, still is. I knew about it. Uh, The glass house comes with this calling. It's not just what you say. It's not just what you preach and what you teach. uh, But it's also how you live. Talking the talk doesn't do you any good in this profession unless you can also walk the walk. And people watch you very closely when you're a clergy member because Nothing makes for a better news story than a pastor who gets into trouble. Now, growing up, we used to take full advantage of this with our father. Uh, We would have fun with him. He would uh, preach a sermon on love or forgiveness or patience. And then uh, later that week, we'd do something to get in trouble. And we'd say, "Um, uh, Dad, don't you remember what you said last Sunday about forgiveness Uh, Don't you remember what you said about patience, uh, about love? Uh, Remember what you said about how you shouldn't get angry in life? Just a trick of the trade for preacher's kids, right? The problem is it's going to come full circle on me now. A few years ago, there was a a survey done here in Nashville by a guy named Tom Rainier. Tom is the president of Lifeway uh, Christian Resources based right here in, in Nashville. But uh, for over a decade now, Tom has been researching the unchurched, the people in our culture who don't go to church or who used to go to church, but now they left the church. And he's been trying to figure out exactly why uh, they don't go to church. Um, The results of his research have been very interesting. Contrary to popular belief, Rainier says that non-Christians are not turned off by the church or by preaching by Sunday school, or even by evangelism. But there were some other things that bothered non-Christians or the unchurched about the Christian community. These included Christians 
who treated other Christians poorly. The unchurched don't expect Christians to be perfect, but they can't understand why we would treat each other without dignity and respect. Non-Christians are bothered by the holier-than-thou attitudes. Uh, The unchurched know that Christians will make mistakes, and they often have a forgiving attitude when we mess up, but they are repulsed when Christians act superior to them. Non-Christians are bothered by Christians who talk more than they listen. Many of the unchurched at some point have a perception that a Christian is a person who can offer a sympathetic and listening ear. But unfortunately, many of the unchurched thought that Christians were just too busy to take the time to listen to them. And lastly, Rainier reports that non-Christians are bothered by Christians who don't go to church or who very rarely attend church. They saw a major disconnect between belief and practice in the lives of Christians who never go to their churches. Now he concludes his research by saying they are all aware that any human will stumble at times, but these unchurched individuals want to know that Christians will treat each other well and they will see humility in our lives. They want to know that we will take the time to listen and even more time to get involved and to show interest in the lives of other people. And they want to know that we love our churches and that we are committed to supporting our churches. When you read the Gospels, it becomes very clear that Jesus really didn't think a whole lot of religious talk. He said, beware of wolves in sheep's clothing. You will know them by their fruit. He denounced the scribes and the Pharisees of that day who could uh, quote scripture, use fancy words, say fancy prayers, uh, utter profound uh, theological statements to impress other people. But Jesus was much more interested in faith that led to action, especially actions of love and kindness and compassion. I have found there is nothing more dangerous or scary than an evil or manipulative person hiding under a Christian disguise. I once asked somebody who had left the ministry to go to law school and then to become a lawyer, the difference that she saw between church politics and the politics of the real world. And she said, oh, that's easy. The world's politics are much more honest because at least you know where people stand. I said, what do you mean by that? She said, well, in the church, somebody will walk up to you with a a Christian smile on their face and they'll stab you in the eye. That's profound. The disconnect between what we say we believe and what we do is one of the greatest challenges for Christians. Nobody wants to be a hypocrite, but we often are. Words simply don't matter if they are not backed up with actions. People pay more attention to what we do than to what we say. Harvey Cox says that we've now moved from the age of belief that ended somewhere in the middle of the 20th century to the age of the spirit, and I agree with him. But you know, what I think will continue to mark this new era of Christianity, a complete intolerance for those who cannot practice or at least authentically try to practice what they say they believe. In the age of the Spirit, talk is cheap and actions will speak louder than words. You cannot talk about mission and outreach and how important that is if you're not willing to go out on the food project truck or volunteer for Room in the Inn or Mobile Meals or Tools for Schools or Morgan Scott or go on a trip to Guatemala or another mission opportunity. You cannot talk about how important the Bible is in your life if you never take the time to read it or to study it. You cannot talk about how important the church is And how important worship is if you never go. You cannot talk about 
how important prayer is in your life if you never take the time to pray. You cannot talk about how, as Christians, we are called to forgive other people if you are not willing to forgive others and to let go of the past and the people that have hurt you in the past. There must be consistency between what we say, we believe, and how we live our lives. Actions speak louder than words. I was thinking about it this week. You know, there are so many people in this church who put their faith into action on a regular basis. And the risk I run when I start to name some of them is I'm going to leave a lot of them out. But I think about Steve McHugh and David Conrad and Nick Small and John Henderson working around the property almost every day of the week. I think about Porter and Jane Clay Metters teaching two-year-old Sunday school class. Porter did that as soon as his term as board chair was up. I think about Steve and Deb LaForge going to Indonesia and Morgan Scott. I think about Emmy and Jim Thomas going back to Guatemala over and over again. I think about Liz and Allen leading the visitation group and Cynthia Beck leading the gyms and Rob Quinn teaching a young adult class every Sunday. I think about Rhonda Hurst and all the other Sunday school teachers that we have downstairs who teach and inform our children week after week at the 930 hour and at 11 o'clock. I think about Fran Stewart and Cyril and Steve teaching Leadership Woodmont, Ralph Parsons and Sandy Smith uh, teaching a Sunday school class. I think about Nora Rich and Beth Metter cooking for the National Food Project. I think about Mary Welsh Owen, uh, who chairs the board, and Trudy Carpenter, who chairs the elders, and, and uh, uh, George Keith, who chairs the deacons, and Nicole Clayton with personnel, and Carrie Leach with our preschool board. I think about Ann Stauffer leading divorce care every Wednesday night and a spiritual journeys class for, for women every Sunday. I think about Paul and Pam Harden chairing uh, Walk Through Bethlehem for seven years running now. Jay and Meredith chairing our stewardship campaign. Jane Anderson leading weddings and funerals in that ministry. I think about Kathy Patton launching Stephen Ministry and then, and then training our Stephen ministers. Sarah Pay in the women's prayer group. Dennis Beck in Teleconnect and the prayer vigil that he had the idea for us to start. I think about Tom Mathias and the many years that he gave to this church working tirelessly and selflessly around the property. The list is so long and inspiring and I can't even begin to name everybody because it would take too long. These are just a few of the people that put their faith into action on a regular basis. It's essential. Just having a creed or a set of rules and doctrine will not cut it anymore. Simply talking about our faith is not enough. Integrity matters. Intentions matter. Authenticity matters. Being kind to other people regardless of who they are matters. As we look to the future, we have to ask the question, how can we all grow spiritually as followers of Christ and live out what we say we believe? Because the last thing that we need in our world today is a bunch of people who simply talk the language of faith but are not doing everything that we can to live it out. Remember those profound words of St. Francis? He once said, preach the gospel every day. And use words only when necessary.